Tonight we are looking at Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 1, and, uh, a verse that uh, you've probably heard a lot, uh, especially in our culture who likes to do some pretty interesting things and have nobody able to tell them what to do or what not to do. So you see there at the top of your page, uh, Matthew 7, 1, where it says, do not judge. Now, just for all you biblical scholars, is that the whole verse? No, right? That's not the whole verse. The whole verse says, do not judge so that you won't be judged. And this is Jesus talking. So that's the whole verse of verse 1. And obviously there's a lot of context that we'll get into. So Jesus uh, is talking to us and, and telling us how we can, can or cannot judge. So we'll get into that. But commonly, uh, this verse is used to uh, with this interpretation. That Jesus tells us we're not supposed to judge others. Whenever most people quote this verse, they're saying, well, you know, don't, doesn't, don't you know Jesus said you're not supposed to judge people? What's wrong with you? So that's really how this verse gets pulled out of context a lot, that you're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge people. We're not supposed to judge other people. We're not supposed to judge other people. And it just gets put back in our face all the time. And I say our because it comes at Christians a lot of times. Um, people say that Christians are just judgy people and <coughs> condemning kind of people. And uh, how can we be that way? Because Jesus said not to judge. And so here's some just some common quotes. These aren't necessarily from certain people, but these are just things that we hear a lot of times. That Christian, Christians are not to pass judgments, only state the truths. So we're not supposed to make any kind of judgment about somebody. We're just supposed to state the truth of what we believe. But is it easy to state the truth about the Bible without coming across judgy sometimes? No. I mean, because we state the truth on some of the lifestyle issues and choices that we're having today that... Uh, you know, if you start to state that truth, depending on how they view that, they're going to say, well, you're just judging me. Um, There's a, a group that I'm a part of on Facebook today, and uh, a youth pastor posted in the group. He said, I've got a student who is a transgender girl wanting to be considered a boy, and she wants to be able to go into the boys' Sunday school class and do all the activities that the boys do. She wants to call her by her boy name. He's like, what do I do? You know, what would you do? He was asking for opinions and advice. And, you know, that's just the culture that we live in. And um, if he stands firm and says, no, we're not going to do that, we're not going to you know, call you by your boy name or your feet, you know, and all this kind of stuff, well, then he'll just come across as judgy. And then if he tries to minister to that student in a way that tries to kind of draw, you know, straddle the line but still be firm in what the truth is, but maybe accept her in certain ways, there's going to be other people that judge it. So it's kind of a difficult situation. So Christians are not to pass judgments, but only say the truth. Even that is going to lean towards coming across sometimes as judgmental. Here's another thing that people often say. Christ taught us to love everyone. Judgments are for our Father in heaven, not us. And both of those two statements are true. Christ did teach us to love everyone. And like we'll see later in the evening, judgments are for our Father in heaven, not us, when dealing with certain groups of people. And so uh, there is some truth to both of those statements. Uh, if you judge others, then you obviously are not a Christian because Jesus told us not to judge. And that's the one that we get a lot. You know, either you don't, you're not a Christian or you're not acting like a Christian. Because if you were really a Christian, if you really had the love of Jesus in your life, then you wouldn't judge other people. And so we get that kind of idea uh, a lot of times. These, uh, a lot of times I looked up uh, you know, pictures, images on, on, online. And uh, a lot of them come up and say things like this, don't judge me until you've walked in my shoes. That's a sentiment a lot of people say, you know, if you, you don't know what I've been through, so who are you to judge me? Uh, don't judge me, uh, don't judge me unless you are 100% without mistakes. So basically, unless you're a perfect person, you're not allowed to judge anybody else, which, what does that do? That eliminates everybody from being able to judge any other person. So it's kind of a uh, fallacy there. Um, don't judge my choices if you don't understand my reasons. And the thought behind this quote is that if you understood my reasons, then you would accept my choices. And, or the idea that nobody can uh, criticize your decisions because they are your decisions based on your reasons. And so, you know, there's kind of, it's kind of a cop-out. It's like, you don't get to judge me because you don't completely understand me or don't understand my reasons. Um, and then this is a quote by Demi Lovato. Don't judge me. You know my name, but not my story. So people will say... Well, you don't really know all my background, so you're not able to judge me. You can't, you can't say anything about me. Uh, these next quotes are some that just kind of talk about this verse in particular. Uh, uh, 
by some, some Christian authors and pastors. Uh, Matthew 7, 1 is one of the few Bible verses that non-Christians still seem to know. If you say anything that hints at being critical, a non-Christian may quickly respond with, do not judge. So that's kind of what we talked about. You know, this is one of those verses that it seems like anybody who you would have a critical attitude towards some decision that they make, they instantly know this part of Scripture. <laughs> they may not be able to quote anything else from the Bible, but they know that verse. Uh, Henry Newitt is a Christian author. He said, often I've asked myself, what would it be like if I no longer had any desire to judge another or be controlled by the judgment of others? I would walk the earth as a very light person indeed. And so this just kind of talks about the, the understanding that if you kind of let go of some of the critical aspects of being judgmental, especially judgmental towards the outside world, you kind of that, that burden kind of gets lifted off of you. And uh, you do kind of walk with a little more peace in your life and you realize it's not your responsibility. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, German Christian who uh, fought against the Nazis, said, Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. And that's a really good statement. It leads right into our, the whole theme of our uh, discussion tonight. There are some similar verses in, um, in the Bible. You see them there on your paper. One of them is, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. That's from Luke 6, 37. There's a lot of other verses and context around that verse. In fact, um, this whole passage here in Matthew chapter 7 is parallel to some of the, uh, some of the verses underneath uh, Luke 6, 37. Uh, the next one, therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same thing. Thing. Uh, Romans 2 1. And that'll go along a lot with what we talk about tonight. Romans 14 10. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. It's kind of a reminder that even though we judge other people, ultimately, we have one judge. You know, it doesn't matter if I judge each one of you, even as a brother and sister in Christ, ultimately, we give answer to one person. That is to Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate judge. So we shouldn't live to please one another. We should really live to please Christ. So we need to remember that. And then 1 Corinthians 5, 12-13. We'll talk about this later tonight too. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. So uh, we'll see more about what that means in a little while. So let's talk about the immediate context of the verse. Before we do that, let's read the whole section. So we'll read Matthew uh, 7, verse 1 through 6. 7, 1 through 6. It says, Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, there's a log in your eye. Hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't give what is holy to dogs and toss or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them with their feet, turn and tear you to pieces. So that's the, the whole section. Okay, so this is the immediate context of verse 7 and 1. So this verse begins the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount, chapter, chapter 5, um, and this is going to be the concluding chapter in uh, chapter 7. Um, obviously, um, you know, Jesus didn't say, all right, beginning chapter 5, let me say, you know, and all kind of stuff. These are chapter headings were added later on. So this is an arbitrary division by writers who, you know, were sectioning all the scriptures. So this would have been one long sermon um, that he would have given there on the Mount, uh, uh, there by the Sea of Galilee. So the verse uh, begins the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus paints a picture of one person judging another person or group of, or, or people. Uh, so he's kind of painting this picture about somebody who is judging others or judging uh, another person. Um, and as I was preparing for this, it got really confusing saying, well, this person judges this person who should judge you know, all this kind of stuff. So I've given my people names tonight. Okay, so um, to illustrate this, we're going to use an example of two guys. we got Jim and we've got Dwight. Okay, so Jim... And Dwight, and where Jim is going to be judgmental towards Dwight. Okay, so we've got these two people. All right, so Jim and Dwight, some good-looking guys. Don't y'all like Jim and Dwight? Okay, kind of got big heads, but you know, 
that's okay. And so Jim and Dwight, Jim is being judgmental towards Dwight. So first, uh, Jesus gives a warning of reciprocity, okay? A warning of reciprocity, which means that if you do something to me, I'm going to do something to you. Uh, you're going to get a, some kind of equal uh, reaction from these people that, you, uh, that you're judgmental towards. So he gives a warning of reciprocity. People are going to hold Jim to the same standards to which he tries to hold Dwight. Okay? So people are going to hold Jim to the same standards that he tries to hold Dwight. Now, this could be talking about Dwight. Dwight saying, well, you judging me for, you know, uh, stealing a candy bar? You stole a candy bar just last week. You know, it could be that kind of deal where Dwight is holding him accountable. It's kind of a tit-for-tat kind of thing. Like, Dwight, you're saying this about me? Well, you do the exact same thing. Um, so Jesus is kind of saying that. But also, he just says for... With the judgment you use, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so this could be kind of them going back and forth, but it also could be that other people are going to hold Jim accountable for the things that he says as well. And so you've got Jim who maybe is kind of, maybe he's vocal about his beliefs, or maybe he's vocal about his judgment. But then people, other people are saying, well, you know, you do, you're, you're getting on to us for selling candy bar, but you still candy bars, and you lie to your wife or to your kids or you cheat and are dishonest in business and so they're kind of like saying well you know you're hold, trying to hold us accountable at this point but you forget that you're guilty in all these other points and so that's what Jesus is reminding us it's kind of like saying who are you to judge somebody when you've got your own issues that you need to worry about now if we stopped right here then this whole pop culture interpretation could be somewhat justifiable this idea like, who are you to judge me? You know, who are you to judge me? You're, you're not perfect. How, only a perfect person can judge me, so who are you to judge me? So if we stop right here, this is kind of what we could get from this passage. Do not judge, or you will be judged also. Um, because that's really what the culture wants to say to us. Who are you as a Christian? Or even just who are you as a human individual to judge me? Because you don't know all the stuff I've been through. You don't know what my life is like. Um, come from different backgrounds, you know, whatever the excuses could be, you don't know me, so who are you to judge me? So if we stopped right here, that interpretation could be justifiable, but Jesus doesn't stop here, okay? So he continues going. So Jesus then exposes the real problem with Jim judging Dwight. Uh, Jim has his own glaring sin issues, so why should he be so, so concerned with Dwight's issues? Okay, so Jim is trying to be concerned with Dwight's issues, but who Jim really needs to be worried about is Jim. He doesn't need to be worried about Dwight so much because Jim has his own problems, right? And, you know, it's, it's kind of like somebody who struggles with math trying to fix somebody else's math problem. It's kind of like, why? I don't want you to help me with my math problem because you made a 72 in the last test, you know? I made a 71. I'm going to go talk to, you know, this person over here who made a 93. I'm going to go talk to them. You know, Jim needs to get his own math problems figured out before he helps somebody else with their math problems. Um, and so Jim, Jesus is kind of exposing this, that Jim really needs to work on his own issues before he starts trying to fix Dwight. And so that's why he says, he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? And some people have tried to say, well, the reason that God, Jesus picked speck and log was the speck was the sin. And the log was the law. And the law that the Pharisees had built and developed around the Old Testament law was huge. And they were trying to hit. That's not what it is. If you read through the New Testament, you see Jesus use hyperbole a lot. Y'all know what hyperbole? Whenever you read it, if you're like me, it took you a long time to figure out what hyperbole was. And it's not a football game that goes really fast. Uh, hyperbole really is hyperbole. And uh, seriously, it took me a long time to figure that out. I knew what hyperbole was, but I didn't know that hyperbole was hyperbole. So, sorry. You thought your pastor was smart. And I just busted that bubble, you know. So, hyperbole. Um, it's, just, it's just exaggeration to make a point. Okay? I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. You ever heard somebody say that? Yeah. I don't know why you'd want to eat a horse, first of all. But I've heard people say that. Could they really eat an entire horse? No, that's hyperbole. They're exaggerating to show how how hungry they are. I'm so hungry, my stomach's about to cave in. Physically impossible. But, you know, they might say that to exaggerate what they're talking about. Okay? And so Jesus really, he's using hyperbole. You can't fit a log in somebody's eye. 
You know, he's just he's pointing at making a picture. Yeah, a speck can fit somebody's eye. Your problems are so big they won't even fit in your eye, is what he's trying to kind of point out here. And so why are you worried about the speck in somebody else's eye when you've got a log in your eye? Why are you worried about this little sin issue when we could write a novel about the sin in your life is what he's getting at. And so Jesus exposes the real problem is that Jim has his own glaring sin issues. And then he also points out that Jim is consumed with minor issues in Dwight's life, and the sin in Jim's life is much more serious. So that's kind of that same idea with the, with the law. Jim, a lot of times, you know, people that are most critical of others are those that have huge things in their life they don't want to deal with. And they figure if they can keep the focus on other people, they can keep the focus off of them. You know what? And we as Christians are no, we're not exempt from that tendency. You know, to try to point out everybody else's life so much, all their problems so much, all the things they struggle with so much that hopefully people won't look at us. But the problem is, very rarely is, is that the case. We have our own issues that are um, uh, that are that are just as serious. And um, and it also and it might not even be things that we think of that are the glaring issues in our life. Like for example, uh, let's let's play a, a little game of either or or this or that or something. I don't know. We'll, we'll call it something. But let's pick something big, okay? Let's pick abortion, okay? Abortion is a pretty big deal, all right? I mean, that's we believe as Christians that abortion is killing an innocent life. Um, that you're literally taking a life that is alive. That in, in today's culture, they're saying you know pushing that further, and further back. You can have abortions right before a baby's born, and we're even seeing hearing stories about people who let their baby die after it's been born, and that people are okay with that. And so we're having a serious issue in, in our culture where people are okay with killing lives in the matter in the name of convenience, right? And so you got a, a issue that we're very opposed to of what we believe is killing an innocent life, okay? Now what is worse, killing an innocent life or knowing somebody is lost and going to hell and not telling them about Jesus? You don't have to answer out loud unless you, just, you want to. <laughs> but which, which is worse? An innocent life gets killed. That's bad, right? That's, that's awful. But the scripture, the scripture makes it pretty clear that somebody who has never had an opportunity to understand sin and make a decision to turn away from that sin and follow Christ, they have a, they've got a, they're, they're going to go to heaven. Whenever David's son died, uh, David and Bathsheba's son died, David said, he stopped mourning, and he said, I will, uh, he, I will go to him, but he will not come back to me. Because he understood there was going to be a day when they were reunited, because okay, David was going to go see God, so his son must be there as well. So there's understanding where a child like that is going to go and, and be with the Lord. So that baby, it's tragedy that its life was ended, but its life ended here and its life was begun in eternal life. But somebody who dies in this life without Jesus as their Savior is going to spend eternity separated from God. And so if we were to really, really say, you know, can't believe somebody would do an abortion. I can't believe people would advocate for abortion when we are literally keeping the message of eternal life away from people by not sharing the gospel. We have to ask ourselves, honestly, as Christians, I have to ask myself, as a Christian, which is worse? I'm being judgmental for somebody for killing somebody. And I'm forgetting that I'm holding back eternal life from some people by not sharing the gospel. So we can say the same thing about uh, same-sex marriage, the transgender issue, or any number of things that we as Christians tend to kind of get up in arms about. But most of us don't make any effort to share the gospel. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but you know, even us in this room probably don't share the gospel as many times as we could. And I'm talking to myself when I say that, not just, not just the rest of us in this room. And so these are the kind of things we have to ask ourselves. And, and if we really try to understand what this passage says, that's kind of what Jesus is getting at. You know, we, we point out issues in other people's lives, but a lot of times we've got spiritual issues in our life or other sin issues in our life that are way worse and that we should really focus on more than somebody else's. And so Jesus encourages Jim to begin dealing with the sin in his own life so that he'll have a better perspective on how to deal with sin. And then he can, he can help Dwight with his sin, okay? So 
Jesus says Jim needs to begin working on his own sin. Because once you begin working on your own sin, then you can begin turning away from that. And then you begin understanding how to turn away from sin so that you can, so Jim can help Dwight turn away from his sin. It's just like that math illustration a while ago, okay? You got a guy who's making a 71 in math and a guy who's making a 72 in math. You know, they're not going to be a whole lot of help with each other. But maybe if that one of those guys begins learning more about math, then he can help the other one get his grades up. And so as we begin learning more about repentance, learning more about walking with Jesus as our Savior, learning more about what it means to follow in obedience, then we're more ready and able to help somebody else along in their walk too. Uh, look down, just kind of skipping ahead, look down at that first verse under the next section, Psalm 51, 10 through 13. And um, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but um, that verse, uh, David, is from Psalm 51, which is a psalm of repentance by, and restoration by David after his sin with Bathsheba. And so he confesses his sin, he completely owns his sin, he says that he sinned against God, and then he says, Create me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain, sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And then he says this, Then, then, I will teach the rebellious your ways, and sinners will return to you. So it's not until he's understood his sin, reclaimed a clean heart and a steadfast spirit, renewed the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, restored the joy of salvation, and it's been sustained that he is able and willing and, and prepared to then go help other sinners. So basically, he, he's not like, oh, I admitted I'm a sinner. Let me go find some more sinners and help them out. No, he's got to get solid again with his relationship with Christ so that then he is ready and prepared and able to help people with their sin. So that's what we need to realize Jesus is saying here. It's not that, and this is what is essential to this section. Let me just read the verse. Verse 5, hypocrite, first take that log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, this is the key to this whole passage. It's not verse 1, which is what we love to talk about. Hey, don't judge me. Really, that's not the key of the verse. The key of this whole passage is verse 5. Is look, first deal with your issues so that then you can go help other people with their issues. First deal with that log so then you can go judge people in a helpful way and help them get that speck out of their eye. So you can be a wise judge, an appropriate judge. Not somebody who's judging from a high ivory tower when you got your own issues, but somebody who is been there who has dealt with their issues and now can actually be a helpful guide to somebody else as they deal with that sin in their life. So the point of this whole section is not verse 1, don't judge people, <laughs> which that's what people usually talk about. The whole point of this verse, of this passage, is verse 5, deal with your sin so then you can help other people with their sin. So we need to get that in perspective. And then Jesus ends with a reminder that loving correction is something valuable. Uh, sometimes throwing valuable instruction at people who are destructive will only lead to being dragged to their destructive life. And um, when I read this, when I, when I think about this point, I can't help but think about Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know? Like, there's bound to be a Democrat out there who has a something good and reasonable to say, and there's bound to be a Republican that has something good and reasonable to say in a wholesome way, in a constructive way, but apparently they never make it to the microphone. And I, I say that in generalization. Obviously, there's reasonable people somewhat on both sides. But, you know, whenever it doesn't, it seems like there are certain people in Washington, D.C., like Jesus himself, with all the wisdom in the universe, the personification of wisdom could come, set them down with a cup of coffee and talk to them all day long, and they would go out saying Jesus was a heretic and that he wasn't a Christian. I mean, they would just, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to accept it because they are just so bent on their perspective. They're so just jaded by what they have forced themselves to believe or, or just drink the Kool-Aid for so long. And there's people on both sides. I'm not talking about gay Republicans or gay Democrats. There's people on both sides who are the same way. That that there's no there's just no sense even talking to them because they're ridiculously unreasonable. And we can look at Washington DC, but there's also people in our lives and sometimes we're those people where it doesn't matter how great an argument you make about how they should turn from this area of their life or they should be doing this in their life or man I would love to help you in this area of your life it doesn't matter how 
how, how much you try to help. It's just like, it's just like throwing your pearls before pigs. They're just gonna trample it. They don't wanna be part of it. They're just gonna continue to ignore you, continue to yell at you, continue to hate you, continue to uh, go away from you. And Jesus is saying here, look, there's certain people where your wisdom is not gonna do any good. And so don't continue to waste your wisdom on those people. That doesn't mean that we don't quit pursuing people with the gospel. But you know, there's a difference between pursuing somebody with the gospel and trying to correct them. Does that make, does that make sense? The gospel is God's word of hope and salvation for them. We should always be sharing the gospel with somebody. But trying to correct certain areas of somebody's life, sometimes that's just that's just throwing that per pearls before swine. It's not going to do any good until they receive that gospel message. And so Jesus ends with a reminder that correction is something valuable. And uh, we need to not just waste it. Okay? All right, so let's talk about the verse and the overall message of Scripture. And here's the... Here's what we can kind of gather from this verse, okay? Uh, the true message of this verse is that we shouldn't judge others when we're not willing to judge ourselves first, okay? So it's a pattern. It's an order. Judging is not inherently bad. Judging is not inherently sinful, but there's a right order to it. So we shouldn't be judging others when we're not first willing to judge ourselves. Once you're willing to deal with your own sin and have learned the process of removing sin from your life, then you're in a better position to help others with their sin. And so that's really what this passage in a whole tells us. It's not to not judge people. It's to judge yourself first. Deal with your own sin first. So then you're in a better position to help people along in their uh, relationship with Christ or in their sin issues. Um, so that's really what this verse tells us. Uh, a few other things that we can get uh, just within the overall message of Scripture regarding judging and how to judge people. And, and you know, one thing we have to, as Christians have to realize, the word judging others just has a negative connotation to it. I mean, you know, nobody gets excited about, hey, let's do a Bible study lesson on how to judge others appropriately. Yeah. You, you might want to come to that Bible study. That doesn't sound good, right? But the truth of the matter is, judging people by analyzing them and holding them accountable is a biblical concept. And so we need to understand what it means, and it's just unfortunate that the wording has a negative connotation to it. Uh, our ability to help others to trust, follow, and obey Christ is directly related to our willingness to do the same in our own life. Uh, this is just having that integrity in our words. If we're not willing to do the, the thing that we're encouraging somebody else to do, then our words are empty. Hey, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't steal stuff. Well, you steal stuff, so your words are empty. You should, be, uh, you should have integrity in your business practices and quit lying on your taxes or cheating in, in this business area. Well, you do the same thing. In fact, we work together on this, so who are you to tell me that? So the things that you do in your life have to be reflected in the things you encourage other people to do as well. So our ability to help others trust, follow, and obey Christ is directly related to our own willingness to do the same. And this comes, uh, you can really see this in that passage that I mentioned while ago, Psalm 51. So David says that he wants a clean heart, a steadfast spirit, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in him, restore the joy of my salvation, sustain me by your spirit, and then, here's the order, then, after all that is done, then I'm able to teach the rebellious your ways, and sinners will return to you. So it's not until we, and I don't mean perfectly, because David was not perfect even after this. We see how David shirks some of his responsibility as a father. He's not a great leader after this. I mean, David is by no means perfect after Psalm 51. But he's tried to reorient himself to Christ and to follow or to God and to following God. And so uh, uh, once we reorient ourselves to God, then we're able to treat, uh, teach others to follow the Lord. And the next thing we can see about judging is that Jesus teaches that how we treat others will often be reciprocated. Uh, treat them well, and they'll generally respond well. Treat them poorly, and they'll often respond poorly. Uh, that next verse is there on your sheet. Um, from Luke 6, 7, this is more of the context of that verse we read earlier. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so Jesus teaches that very often how we treat other people is how we're going to be treated as well. Um, if, if there is somebody we disagree with, um, we're much more likely to be able to have a dialogue with them, 
hopefully a dialogue that leads to them seeing our viewpoint if we treat them with respect. And if we're not harsh in our judgment, uh, if we're not critical, come with them with a critical spirit. Uh, Boogie was telling me that uh, at the uh, see at the poll this morning, uh, over there at the Innovation Academy, there was a couple of students, one from our youth group and one who uh, comes from a different denominational background. And they were just going back and forth on silly little theological things that teenagers tend to get caught up on and they think they know a lot. Have you ever heard those teenagers? You know, it's not always theological. It could be cars or it could be money. I mean, teenagers think they know a lot and they like to argue about it. Well, they were arguing about it, you know, and I think it had to do with what type, get this, teenagers in high school, which type of Greek was the New Testament written in? That's what they were, that's what they were arguing about. Like Koine Greek, which is common Greek, or formal Greek. And Boogie said, well, most of it's common Greek, but there are some parts that are formal Greek. So you're both wrong. <laughs> they asked Boogie about it, and he was like, they were like, oh. And they're just kind of like, what do we argue about now? And, uh, but, you know, sometimes uh, we, we are harsh with people or we criticize people, but if we just have a good dialogue with people, they're, they're more likely to be willing to have a good dialogue with us. And if we approach them, even in a, to address a sin issue in their life, if we approach them with love, with compassion, with a sense of, hey, I've been there. This is how God freed me from this sin. Can I help you get that same freedom? We kind of approach them with that same kind of attitude. We'll, be, we'll receive a lot more, at least, of an open door whenever we talk to them that way. So there's this idea of uh, how we treat people will be reciprocated. Uh, judging sinful people for acting like sinful people is not our responsibility. And, we, and this is what we need to hear, okay, as Christians. It's not our responsibility to judge the world for acting like the world. Now, that doesn't mean that as an American citizen, we can't vocalize our thoughts on certain things. That doesn't mean that as Christians, we can't vocalize our beliefs on certain things. But it's not our responsibility to sit here in judgment at a lost person for acting like a lost person. It's just like whenever my kids were... Uh, getting around one years old and they were learning to walk and they were walking around and they fell down, I didn't say, what is wrong with you? You took a step. Why can't you take 10? <laughs> you know? You walk 10, why can't you walk a mile? I mean, they were a baby. They were just learning to walk. And so I had to respond to them and treat them like a baby. And I do this sometimes. <laughs> this is confession time. Sometimes, uh, sometimes my boys will just be acting awful. And I'm just like, you're just acting like a child. <laughs> You know, and then, and, then I'm, and then I think to myself, he's five years old, he's six years old. Of course, he's six now, six now, so he's he's out he's of childhood. He's good. He's good. He's good. But you know, like, oh, you're acting like such a child, and I just kind of like want to just slap myself because I literally just, you know, I just literally just convicted myself of my own frustration. You know, and so a lot of times we we kind of get on to the world for acting like the world, and that's not our responsibility. Uh, First Corinthians. 5, 9, 9 through 10, and then verse 12 says this. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral, immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. And what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Paul, Paul kind of, this is one of those aha, that's so obvious, thank you, Captain Obvious kind of moments. It's like, look, I'm not telling you as Christians to not engage with people in the world, otherwise you'd all have to get on a spaceship and go live on the moon. You know? Because how, I mean, how can we live our lives and not interact and engage with the lost? It would literally be impossible. Literally be impossible. And so Paul is saying, look, uh, I'm not saying to not engage with them. Just don't judge them. It's God's responsibility to judge them. He says, for what business is it mine to judge outsiders? And so the only judging that we're responsible for as Christians, okay, this is important for us to understand, when it comes to judging somebody and calling them out for not acting like a Christian, the only judging that we're responsible for, aside from ourselves, is judging fellow believers with the purpose of accountability and restoration. God is the one who judges unbelievers. Okay? God is the one who judges the unbelievers. So our purpose as Christians and Christians and hold them accountable and seek to restore them to faithful obedience to God's word. And I will add here that this doesn't mean just people you know without a doubt are Christians. This, this applies
because anybody who claims to be a Christian, who claims to be in the overall Christian brotherhood of believers. That's why it's okay for us to call out a preacher who preaches something that's completely foreign to the message of the scripture. That's okay. And we may sit here and think there's no way he can be a Christian and be saying that. Well, he's claiming to be a Christian, so we call it out. It also means that we can call out people who are of Christian faith, like Mormons or Jehovah's Witness, because their gospel message is not this gospel message. It's completely foreign to the scriptures. Their gospel message is a gospel of works, not a gospel of grace. But they claim to be Christians, so we call them out on what they believe and what they claim. And so our responsibility is to judge fellow believers and those who claim to be fellow believers for the purpose of accountability and to restore them to faithful obedience to the gospel. But God's responsibility is to judge non-believers. And this is the other part of that verse we just read there in Corinthians. It says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. So he's saying, look, I wrote you not to talk about other people who act this way, outsiders who act this way. I wrote to you to talk to you about Christians who act this way. Anybody who is a Christian who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler, not a complete list. Parentheses, not a complete list. Do not even eat with such a person. And why would he say that? Do y'all know why he says do not even eat with such a person? Don't break bread. Don't, don't break bread with them? That's a good insight. Because in their culture, table fellowship meant acceptance of who that person is. So that's like us saying, uh, don't invite somebody who is a public homosexual who claims to be a Christian to preach on Sunday morning. That's kind of what that's saying. Like, don't approve of their immoral lifestyle when they claim to be a Christian. Because table fellowship meant that you approved of who they were and what they stood for in the Jewish culture. Uh, that's why in the New Testament, whenever you see uh, Peter sitting down to eat with uh, Gentiles, that was a huge deal. And there was one point where Peter was sitting down eating with Gentiles and some people from James who were more law-abiding Christians came into the room, Peter stood up to try to remove himself from the fellowship of those Gentiles, and Paul called him out on it. Because, because what he was basically saying, he was getting up from the table of acceptance and saying, no, 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 I don't accept these Gentiles. I'm not, I was not eating with these Gentiles. Is basically what he was saying, because table fellowship and acceptance. So that's why Paul says, don't even eat with such a person, because eating with them was the baseline fellowship with them. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? He says, don't you judge those who are inside. God judges the outsiders. And then he says, remove the evil person from among you. And so Paul is saying here that our responsibility as Christians is to judge those who are inside the fellowship of Christ, not judge those uh, or hold those accountable who are outside the fellowship of Christ. And then in Galatians 6, he says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So this goes to the idea of restoration. It's not just judgment. It's not just saying, ha I caught you. You're guilty. But it's that idea of you catching somebody, or them confessing it even better, holding them accountable for what the sin is in their life, and then seeking to restore them to fellowship. That's how church discipline is supposed to work in a church. When somebody does something wrong, we don't just say, how dare you? No, we, we remove them from leadership if that's necessary. We don't kick them out of the church if they're willing to repent and turn from that sin. We try to get them to repent. We try to get them to go in a different direction. And then the goal is to restore them to full fellowship within the church. Ultimately, maybe even to restore them to leadership within the church in some way. The goal is always accountability, but also restoration. And unfortunately, we as Christians are really good at shooting our wounds. If somebody messes up, we just want to kick them to the curb. Or we pick sides. You know, when a, a couple a couple gets divorced or there's some infidelity, we pick a side. We're like, we're on this person's side. You go over there and you, you deal with your own sin. You go to another church and get your issues together. When if they're part of our body and part of our fellowship, the goal is restoration of both of those, those parties, whether it's a divorce or an argument or something like that. It's to restore both people to fellowship. So that's really what this verse teaches us and what this verse is telling us overall in Scripture. But what about that misinterpretation? Don't judge people. Is that taught in Scripture? 
Well, obviously after tonight, I'm going to say not really. Uh, the, the idea of, hey, don't judge people is not, you know, or if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to judge people. That is not taught in Scripture. Jesus gives guidelines for appropriate judgment, but just does not uh, command us to never judge others. Yeah, so Jesus never says, don't judge people at all. He just gives guidelines for how we're supposed to judge people. And it's not to come across judgy like the world says or uh, to appear critical or condemning. Remember John chapter 3 says that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world because the world was condemned already. We don't have to go around condemning people. No, you're going to burn in hell. You're going to burn in hell. You know, like and with that kind of attitude, they're already on their way. Why don't we, instead of telling them where they're, you know, just focusing only on where they're going, why don't we say that's where you're going, but here's where you could go. You know, point them in a new direction. That's the message of the gospel. That's the so Jesus doesn't say, do not judge ever, but he does give us parameters of how to do it. So that's how we can understand uh, Matthew 7-1 in its proper context.